Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon, a community-based approach to conserving Preble's Meadow jumping mouse, a threatened species. This webinar is hosted by the Poudre, the North Fork of the Poudre River Site Conservation Team. This is a second community event that this group has hosted. Last September, we hosted an event um, outdoors in Livermore on the North Fork of the Poudre, thanks to Bob West and Alana Day, who hosted us at their Whiskey Bell Ranch. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening to this webinar. Let's start with introductions. Uh, my name is Heather Knight, for those of you I don't know. I'm a member of the site conservation team. Um, you'll hear us use the acronym SCT. And I'm also a landowner with my husband here in Livermore. This is the current list of members of our site conservation team. It's comprised of private landowners. We have four representatives so far conservation organizations, you can see these groups that work in our watershed, Colorado Open Lands, the Nature Conservancy Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. We have a, a consultant from Jacobs Engineering who's doing work on the expanded proposed Halligan Reservoir. Local government um, natural resource agencies, the City of Falcons Utility, the City um, Natural Areas Program and Larimer County Department of Natural Resources. State public land agencies are represented by the Colorado Water Conservation Board, Colorado State University and the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the State Land Board. And then finally, our federal agency partners on the SCT team, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the US Forest Service, and of course, the Fish and Wildlife Service. That, that's our current team membership. Um, you'll see um, in that mustard colored text, these are our speakers and facilitators this evening for this webinar. And those highlighted in gray are folks available always to answer your public inquiries. Um, this full roster with um, email and phone numbers are found on our website. And Megan, I'll ask you to um, put that in the chat for everybody so that you can download it from our website. Also, we're really interested in more landowners joining us. So if you have an interest in joining, please contact uh, myself and I'll have Megan add um, my email to the chat and also Dale Oberlog, who's the co current co-chair of the SCT team. We have many members of the SCT group joining us tonight, and I really appreciate um, the speakers and facilitators and people who've taken time to put this webinar together. So let's hear from all of you. Let's hear who has joined us tonight. What we'd like to do is invite you all to um, hover at the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat. We'd like you to open that and then type in your name and the stream that you live closest to in the watershed. Uh, if there's more than one of you in your household joining, please put both names. And then also we're building an email um, contact list. So if you'd like us to communicate with you via email in the future, please add that as well. I give you a few minutes, give everybody a few minutes to join the chat and introduce yourself with your name and the stream that you live closest to in the watershed. So we're starting to see folks from Rabbit Creek. Hi, Reed and Steve. I see Nancy and Jim on the North Fork. See Linda up on Rabbit Creek, North Rabbit Creek. Some folks from uh, Redstone Creek. Hi Doug, I see you joined. Good to see you on the North Fork. Thanks, I see a couple of email addresses, so we'll add you to our email list. 
Oh, we've got somebody joining from Jefferson County. Nice to meet you. Bull Creek. So please, um, it looks like we've got a good representation um, from across the uh, watershed here. Please continue to add um, to this as we go along. If you haven't already entered your name and the and uh, the creek where you live closest to. So welcome everybody. We appreciate you attending this event. So why are we here tonight? Um, first and foremost, we really want to celebrate the good stewardship of the river um, that provides um, benefits for people and for our natural resources. Um, specifically, we want to talk about the good community stewardship and recognize that, um, that all of you have contributed to. We want to share information with you and learn about the history of the listing of Preble's Mouse and the planning that's already occurred in the watershed. Rob Shaw is going to talk about the habitat and life history of the mouse and how we learn about it. We'll also talk about compatible management practices. We want to talk about this new community approach to conserving and recovering species. And we also want to talk about opportunities for landowners. And Dale will mention that as will George San Miguel. Most of all, we want to listen to all of you um, and hear your thoughts, questions, and comments. And so as we go along, we encourage you to put your questions and comments in the chat. So specifically the agenda, this is what it looks like. We've had our introductions. And if you haven't put your name and the stream that you live close to, please do that in the chat. We'll have three speakers, each about 15 minutes. So Rob Shore from the Colorado Natural Heritage Program will speak first about prebles, their habitat, where and how they live, how we learn about them. Dale Oberlog from the US Forest Service will then talk about the site conservation team, its purpose, how it works, and the process. And then George San Miguel from the Fish and Wildlife Service will talk about the recovery process and the nomination process. After each speaker, um, we don't want you to fall asleep, so we have a quick poll after each one. And Megan Mayello Heath will manage those polls for us. And those are questions that we have of interest for all of you. And then finally, there'll be a 15 to 20 minute discussion, question and answer session. Um, so as we go through, as I mentioned, please put your questions and comments in the chat as you hear the speakers. And Megan and Alice will manage the discussion. Stay for the end of the discussion because there's an opportunity drawing you might be a winner, but only if you're still with us. And thanks to the City of Fort Collins Utility and the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed for providing the swag for that. And then lastly, I'll wrap us up with what's next and how to stay tuned. Final housekeeping from me. Um, you'll see that we are recording this webinar and um, we really want people who aren't able to attend tonight to have the benefit of watching this. And you will also receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And, as, and in addition, resources that we mentioned. So we'll be together for about an hour and a half. Um, and please remember the chat, add your questions and comments as we go through the speakers. Before I end the introduction, just a little bit of Preble's history for those of you who've been here for a while, this is a reminder for those of you who are new in the watershed, hopefully this will give you some useful information. In 1995, the Laramie Foothills Advisory Group was formed in our watershed, the North Fork of the Poudre. And it formed because there was huge change going on in the US and Colorado was the fastest growing state in the nation. And people in this community were concerned about our natural resources and the changes of people moving from city to urban areas and the conversion of agricultural lands to those uses. So conservation groups and ranchers recognized that we needed to work together because we both love this place, we care about it, 
we care about it because we want it to produce local food, but we also want to enjoy these natural resources. In 1998, we had a bit of a surprise when Preble's mouse was listed, and George San Miguel will talk more about that. But that really um, made us think carefully about what would be our approach in the community. Four members of the advisory group stepped forward and spent seven years, and we wrote the Livermore Area Habitat Conservation Plan that was signed off by the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2005. Then in 2018, the recovery plan was written. So over those intervening years, the Fish and Wildlife Service formed their recovery team and wrote their recovery plan for the species, and it was signed in 2018. <clears throat> the exciting news is that because of that habitat conservation plan and um, the recovery plan included community engagement. And this was at a very new level than ever seen before. And what that resulted in in 2019 was the creation of these site conservation teams. And Dale will talk more about those. So this is the new approach, the establishment of site conservation teams to work on the recovery of the species. There's some really good news that I also wanna share right up front here with all of you. We've estimated that at least 60% of stream miles in our watershed occur on public lands and conserve private lands. That's habitat for prebles. We also have, um, because we have a lot of habitat, that means we have a lot of compatible land uses, ranching, passive recreation, hiking, bird watching, fishing, et cetera. And we have very limited development right down close to streams. So this is all good news for us, that we have a large amount of habitat already occurring and it's in good shape. And we have compatible land uses. We also have the habitat conservation plan in place and we're developing other tools for landowners who are interested, who wanna participate. And then we have this new approach and willing partners willing to work with landowners and public land managers who voluntarily want to participate. So this is all good news for us in this watershed, and we think that it will really help us all recognize the good stewardship that you've all done over these years and help us check this off our list of things to pay attention to. Those are my introductory remarks. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Megan for our first poll and she'll give you the instructions and then we'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Megan. Thank, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna launch the first poll here and our question for you all is, what is your primary interest in the North Fork of the Pooter? Um, it is a multiple choice, so feel free to um, pick any that apply to you. And I will uh, give you all about a minute to answer this. And then I will share the results with all of you once everyone has posted. All right, we have quite a mix here and I've got about 70% of you answered. So I'll give you another 10 seconds here. All right. One last chance. Okay, so we have quite a mix. Can you all see the results? Great. All right. Thank you all. So for it looks like it looks like sixty percent private landowners. We have about 40% citizens, natural resource professionals, and recreators, and other. Great. Thank you, Megan. So we'll pass it on now to our first, our first speaker, Rob Shaw. Let me know if you can see that out there and if you can hear me. 
Thumbs up will do. We can All see right. and hear. Perfect. Well, good evening, everyone, on this snowy northern Colorado uh, evening. Appreciate you joining us. My name is Rob Shore. I'm a zoologist with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program at Colorado State University. So much of what I do is study rare, lesser known species in Colorado. I've studied everything from lizards to snakes to frogs to bats, but I have a particular affection for this little mouse um, because I've been studying it since 1997. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, looking for habitat, um, capturing this mouse, doing population studies, and just understanding its general ecology. So thankfully, I get an opportunity to share that with you. So what I typically like to do with most of these talks is before I even tell you what I think we know about this species is tell you how we know what we know about the species. So um, with this little mouse, uh, one of our main tools for understanding where it is, is using live traps. And these are small metal boxes that have a trigger inside and we can bait them with a mix of seeds. And jumping mice are pretty um, accommodating that they'll periodically wander into these and we'll get some idea of where they are and how they're doing. Another tool that we've used is radio telemetry. And despite their size, is that we can put on a little telemeter uh, on these uh, animals. And the top picture there is me with an antenna uh, listening for the beep coming back so that we can find out where below us um, that mouse is using the habitat. That picture just below is just all the materials that we need to do the anesthetizing and the attachment for a collar on something that small. Another tool that we use is actually just sampling the habitat, going out there and measuring what that habitat looks like. And uh, that takes a bit of time to try and describe what we think a mouse that's as uh, small as this one is using. Um, but uh, through that, we get a better understanding what pieces of the environment they are really focusing on. Another tool that we can use um, are cameras, motion sensitive cameras. And it's not really trapping, but just documenting when they're in an area by having a camera triggered when they enter an area. And the device that I've been using is just an upturned bucket with this motion camera at the top pointed down. And that uh, black and white picture at the bottom is of a jumping mouse that wandered into one of these. Another tool that's commonly used in conservation biology is genetic identification. And we can use this for understanding how populations communicate, uh, understanding differences between species and subspecies. And that's been a common tool in the history of prevalence of meadow jumping mice. And the last piece here is marking and recapturing. So when we do live trapping, we have the option of tagging mice with unique identifiers. And the same kind of microchips that you may have had um, uh, inserted into your dog or cat at the vet is we can use some of those same technologies on jumping mice. And we've been able to tag hundreds of these and figure out who survives each year and what the abundance might be in the area and how many uh, individuals are reproducing each year. So those can, these tools can give us a better idea of what's happening with the populations, their habitat, and just the general ecology. So Probably the best place to start is that uh, this little mouse doesn't look like a lot of the other mice that we find in these systems. As you've seen from the previous photos, and you can kind of see here, especially from the bottom one, is that these mice have an extraordinarily long tail, sometimes twice as long as their body. In the top two pictures, the tail actually extends outside of the frame of the picture. The other thing you'll notice from the top picture is the size of their hind feet. These things almost look like reduced kangaroos, long tail, big hind feet. Um, and they jump really well, even through dense habitats that they live in. The other key characteristic that most people pick up on is there's this dark stripe down the back. So if you look at the sides of some of the pictures in here, it's a lighter color, sometimes an orange or a brown. And that really offsets it from most of the other species that we encounter, the size, the tail, the hind feet, there's just not much else you can confuse with a jumping mouse in these habitats. The next thing to know about these guys is that they're true hibernators. So they might weigh anywhere from, you know, young can be six grams up to a big adults that can be 25 grams. 
but they're true hibernators, meaning that they go underground when it gets cold, sometime in late September, early October, it really depends on what's happening outside. But once their food resources become unavailable, the temperatures drop, and they'll go underground. And that picture of the one balled up is one in this state of torpor, where they've shut down their physiology to the point where we can hardly detect their heartbeat, and their body temperatures can be sometimes near freezing. So they'll physiologically shut down over winter when they can't get access to their main food source. And that main food source are seeds, whether it be from grasses like this or forbs, these are energy rich food resources that help jumping mice put on a lot of fat prior to hibernation. Their only energy reserve is the amount of fat they accumulate before they go underground. So it's critical that they have these kind of energetic resources available in the environment so they can put on that kind of fat that can sustain them. Since their window of activity during the summer is pretty short compared to most other small rodents, they come out of hibernation sometime in May and might go in as early as October. And so that's a pretty narrow window to do everything you might need to do. And because of that, they have the capacity to really um, put a lot of young into the environment. They can have two litters per year and they can produce up to eight um, young per litter. That's not typically the case. Average is four or five. That picture at top is actually of a couple of the young ones. You can see how they have that kind of orange, lighter coloration when they're young. The two other species that we commonly inter encounter in the systems where jumping mice are fined are meadow voles and deer mice. So the top left picture here is of a meadow vole. And these uh, small mammals eat predominantly, predominantly grass. And so I described them as little cows because they are active all season long eating grass, which takes uh, a lot of eating to get a lot of energy from. And uh, they actually have gut compartments to help them process those. The deer mouse in the bottom picture here is an omnivore, um, eats anything from seeds to grass to insects to most anything you can get that's uh, a food source. And it's probably the most common rodent a wild rodent in North America. Now, jumping mice and deer mice and voles are relatively small um, on the landscape. And so they are regularly the prey of most everything out there. They're at the bottom of the food chain. And so there's a host of predators that are hunting jumping mice and other mice like them. The top picture here is of a Western terrestrial garter snake. And where I do a lot of my studies, this is the common predator I encounter almost daily. And in this picture, there's a jumping mouse in the mouth of this you know, relatively large Western terrestrial garter snake. The bottom right picture is of a red tailed hawk. And another common predator where I've studied them is a, a long tailed weasel pictured here. But that isn't the limit of the predators that exist out there that are feeding on them. Owls, even bullfrogs that live in the water nearby can, can eat them. Domestic cats have been known to eat them. But the list is most anything that preys on rodents and get access to them will. Jumping mice are not the easiest thing to get access to because of the environment they live in, but they can be eaten by a whole host of things. Okay. The habitat that jumping mice are found in, we typically describe as riparian. So that term just refers to the systems along a river or creek. And these are the dense vegetated zones that are in close proximity to either side of the creek. And they're really dense with shrubs and they're really dense with ground cover. To give a kind of an illustration of that, in the bottom left is my son who is helping me do field work. And he's about five, eight in this picture. And you can tell how the vegetation is almost double his height in that area. And the two yellow flags that you see, those are three meter tall flags the one on the far left is extended fully. The one uh, down below isn't extended completely. But you can kind of get an impression of how dense this shrub growth can get in these riparian systems. The top picture is me looking down at my feet to give you an idea of just how much cover there is on the ground in some of these systems where we find jumping mice. And to be honest, this isn't even as dense as it can get. This just happened to be an area that was open enough that uh, I could take a picture without shrubs being in the way. But you can kind of give an idea of how much green cover there is. There's very little bare ground. It's 
I describe to people that if it's difficult for me to get through, that's what jumping mice like. They spend probably 95% of their time in that dense vegetated zone in close proximity to the creek, but they do venture into the surrounding uplands for some limited amount of time. To find hibernacula, they'll come into those systems and they'll periodically throughout the summer, summer venture up into those areas we think to get access to some of the grass and forb seed resources that are up there. So when I, when I get the question about the conservation value of jumping mice, is I tend to focus on the habitat that they're in simply because I think prebles not jumping mice and jumping mice in general are great indicators of where we have healthy riparian systems because that seems to be about the only place that we find them in, in great abundance. And those systems are hugely valuable for more than just conservation of jumping mice. I've seen firsthand how some of the areas where I've studied jumping mice have been phenomenal at limiting the impacts of dramatic floods. I do a lot of studies at the Air Force Academy and we've had multiple hundred year flood events that didn't seem to impact those systems nearly as much as they did downstream in some of the other areas that don't have those meandering streams with a vegetative cover that they do at the academy. And that vegetative cover really holds soils well and reduces the erosion and the impacts of even something as dramatic as those huge flooding events. These systems are amazing at producing good water quality because of the way those systems can filter the water. They are known for their value in cycling nutrients through the water and soil better than a lot of other systems out there. And the primary reason that I spend a lot of time there is that's an easy way that I can get access to a whole host of wildlife. Is that we know that water is a huge resource in the arid environments of Colorado, and that goes doubly for the wildlife. Is that they are in riparian systems and water systems disproportionately compared to the amount of space those environments take up on the landscape. And the last piece is that I'm a fly fisherman, so when I'm not chasing jumping mice, I'm sometimes in these systems throwing a fly into the waters. And the recreational resources and the property value that those that these systems add are hugely valuable, especially that we recognize in Colorado with as much recreational opportunities we have and that we want. So when I end up talking about the conservation of jumping mice, it, ends up going further than just this little mouse that nobody gets to see very often, but to these systems that generate so much value for us and for the wildlife and the natural resources value that we seem to prioritize. So I will stop sharing and let uh, Heather take over again. And Heather or Megan, you let me know if there's questions you need me to answer. All right, thank thanks, you. Rob. I don't see any questions yet, um, but if you all can do our second poll here, which is um, actually going to be within the chat, let Rob know what was the most interesting thing you learned from uh, him about Preble's mouse. And Heather, if you want to uh, read some of these out loud, I'm not sure if everyone can see them or not. Yeah, so I'm seeing people say um, a true hibernator was interesting to learn. Um, people are wondering about the identification of them. Um, the tracking people are interested in how you can track them and uh, learning about the habitat and the photographs for ID, again, I see. Um, they really, uh, people appreciated your description, Rob, of the, um, of the habitat um, range there. And, and somebody asked about the elevational range, if you wanna mention that as well. Sure, is um, our highest captures, at least in some areas, have been about 7,600 feet in elevation. For some reason, this mouse just doesn't go up much further than that. Um, we think that 
this mouse is what they call a glacial, glacial relic and that when glaciers receded is that this mouse constrained its habitat to the similar moist environments that it could get access to. And in Colorado, those aren't nearly as available. They seem to be constrained to where we have uh, water nearby. And those seem to be the most humid environments. So we think that they're really restricted to these. And for some reason, they just don't extend up too much higher than 7,600 feet. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for your comments in the chat. And Rob, thank you for the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing now and pass it off to our next speaker, Dale Oberlog. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that you can see my screen. Can you see it? slide not yet okay um oh there we go how about now no not yet oh There we go, Dale. Okay. All right. Um, well, yeah, my name is Dale Oberlog. I'm a wildlife biologist on the Arapahoe Roosevelt National Forest at Pawnee National Grassland. I, my area on the forest covers Canyon Lakes Ranger District, you know, here west of Fort Collins, west of North Fort Collins, and uh, Pawnee National Grassland. So it includes the North Fork Pooter watershed. Um, I've been on this forest since 2007. So been working with Prebles for, um, in terms of being concerned about it for quite a while. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly talk about our North Fork Pooter site conservation team, uh, the process of the, of the team and, and its purpose, because just briefly, because George is gonna really gonna give more details about what our individual team has done to date. Um, so as, as Heather mentioned, the site, this, the site conservation team idea uh, was, was part of the 2018 Preble's Mouse Recovery Plan. And um, I, I believe it's the first time that the Fish and Wildlife Service has used this sort of multi-party team. Um, and what's more, it's their local teams. Um, and there'll be there'll be multi, there are multiple teams already in operation. There'll be more kind of scattered the range of the mouse. George will show kind of the range later in a map. Um, so we have just this North Pooter watershed, um, and the purpose of it ultimately, obviously, is to contribute to recovery and eventual delisting uh, of the Preble's mouse from the Endangered Species Act. It's it's listed as threatened. Um, it won't be just our watershed. It'll have to be, you know, if it's when, when it's delisted, it'll be throughout the range. But um, and then also the, you know, the purpose of the team is to work with kind of with the community, um, you know, private landowners, uh, municipalities, other federal and state landowners, and and willing landowners and public agencies to maintain and improve Preble's habitat um, if there needs to be improvement in a certain area. See. Trying to forward my my slide here. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's. The, the Preble's Mouse just kind of ranges in the basically the foothills of so, southeast Wyoming, kind of just east of Casper, basically down through the uh, the foothills and into Colorado, down down to around Colorado Springs. And in that area, there's 16 watersheds identified that 
include that Preble's Mouse range. And George has a map later that shows this better. Um, but within those larger watersheds, the mouse really only occurs in a pretty narrow, a much narrower band. And that's as, as, as Rob said, basically in and along streams in the riparian habitat below 7,600 feet elevation in the Southeast Wyoming down to Colorado Springs, Colorado Front Range foothills. Um, I, I noticed in the chat, somebody asked about the lowest elevation. They don't go very far out onto the prairie, at least, at least not now. Um, I think some thought is that you just don't typically have the extensive riparian veg as you go out on the prairie. There's, there may be some short areas of where there's some shrubs and dense grasses, but it's not just not very continuous. So it really is kind of in the front range foothills here up to about 7,600 feet. Um, and just the status of our particular individual site conservation team. So we were the first team established under this new recovery process. Um, we, I think we actually started in June, 2019. I have August there, but that's when we kind of had our first meeting. So we've been working on this a little bit. Um, and um, our, our watershed represents what's called, the, what's referred to as a large recovery population within the North Recovery Unit. So within that range of the mouse, it's broken into a, a, south, a North Recovery Unit and a South Recovery Unit. And they're basically divided by the Denver metropolitan area. Um, and within each of those units, there's watersheds that have been identified to have a large recovery unit, one in the North, us, and then one in the South, and then what are called medium-sized populations and small populations. Um, so while we've been working, we've identified our conservation planning area, kind of the boundary of our area. And you'll see a map of this later, but basically it's North Fork Pooter watershed at the top of, from the top of Seaman Reservoir upstream, including all the tributaries uh, up to the dam at Seaman Reservoir, excuse me, Halligan Reservoir. We clipped off the Seaman Reservoir itself and Halligan Reservoir because, you know, the reservoirs don't typically have much repairing vegetation around them because of the rise and fall of the water with water management. And then, of course, there is a Preble's habitat in the North Fork watershed above Halligan Reservoir, but because of that barrier of the reservoir, the, the habitat and the recovery population that we'll nominate is supposed to be connected, and we felt that was a breaking connection. Um, so that's our conservation planning area. We've, through actual ground field visits where we could, uh, in combination with some aerial imagery to kind of extrapolate or in, interpret what habitat we thought was there, we've evaluated the riparian habitat conditions and suitability of the streams in our planning area. And uh, just real quickly, besides the main stem, North Fork Pooter, our streams are Lone Pine and North Lone Pine Creek. The Rabbit Creek system, including all the all the forks, you know, middle, north, and south, um, Stonewall Creek, and a little bit of Ten Mile Creek. And then, um, after doing the habitat evaluations, we've identified the stream segments that we will forward to Fish and Wildlife Service as a nomination for a recover, recovery population. That, that would go to Fish and Wildlife Service and the Preble's Mouse Recovery Team. The recovery team is kind of also a multi-party group. It's not just Fish and Wildlife Service. There's other federal agencies. There's um, just individual biologists, Preble's experts, et cetera, on the team. And then just, to, so that's where we are. That's what we've done so far. And then. Uh, this is a long-term process, um, so some of the future steps that we're going to do, and I didn't include it here, but there will be some monitoring via live trapping that will occur for 10 years. Um, but kind of our, our next step in the near future is starting working to develop a conservation plan for management of prevalent mouse habitat, and that will kind of be a qualitative general plan that will include recommended land and habitat management practices, projects that 
that can be implemented to maintain or improve habitat as the case may, may be if it's needed. Um, it'll have some information on land management actions that um, aren't, 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 aren't necessarily incompatible with Preble's house man, man, uh, habitat, but you know, they can reduce the quality of it. And maybe through just minor changes, subtle changes, you can you can improve the habitat quality for mice as well as the whole riparian area for all the wildlife species that use riparian habitat. Um, and then we'll identify and uh, and develop financial resources, basically grants um, that we hope we can bring to the table to work with willing landowners. Uh, that that want to work with us to where they may need to or, or want to do some some kind of management action or management change to improve um, or even just to maintain uh, prevalence habitat if it's already in good condition. Um, yeah. So how can private landowners and public land managers participate? So first and foremost, you you can join the SCT. To support the local recovery efforts, efforts within our our uh, North Fork Poudre Conservation Planning Area, and there's kind of a list here of potential programs available that you could participate in to provide protection and/or habitat maintenance or improvement. And kind of the most simple on the ground one is the first one there: habitat improvement projects that you would you could coordinate with our team. Um, other Program uh, possibilities are actually getting a conservation easement on your property that um, would include, you know, habitat benefits for Preble's mouse. Um, participating in the, or joining the Livermore Area Habitat Conservation Plan that, that Heather mentioned earlier, or if you want an individual habitat conservation plan with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, wildlife extension agreements with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or um, me me memorandums of understanding for management uh, on uh, state or public lands. And I mentioned our site conservation team is just one of others that are operating and there, there will be more, but there's four others also currently operating in the North Recovery Unit, north of kind of Denver area. There's uh, a team that's working in the same rain watershed. Um, Medium population again. Ours is a large population, uh, and then we're just now uh, this next month going to have our first meeting for the Buckhorn Creek watershed. Um, you know, just west of Masonville, there kind of. Um, and that's again a medium population, and then in the South Recovery Unit, they there's a the large population. Um, a team's been established for that on in the Plum Creek watershed, and then a medium population. Uh, team for the Monument Creek Watershed. And then, so if you want to learn more about Preble's mice, uh, we've got a lot of information for you. And so uh, there's been reference to our website. We have a, a North Recruiter South Conservation Team website. I'll open that in a moment so you can see it. Um, and these, these listed resources are linked on this website. So we have a kind of just a brief informational poster uh, and a land inf older information sheet with some basic information about Prebles, much of which Rob covered already earlier today. Um, there is a, a pretty lengthy frequently asked questions document. I think there's about, about a couple dozen questions on there um, with answers provided. And then our draft conservation planning area map, which you'll see here when George uh, presents after myself. and. Um, on there also, if you wish, there's a, a, a link where you can sign up just to get updates from our team. Um, also information about upcoming events. This, we've already had one public event before this that Heather mentioned, um, and there will, be, there will be others. And then also just, you can check it for posts. Um, so, and just, I'm gonna show this uh, video in a moment, but just a reminder that other landowners are welcome to join our team. So opening our website here real quick. So you can get a look at it. Oh, 
Okay, can you see that? I have two monitors, so I'm just not sure. Not yet, Dale. Okay, I think I have to move it over to my other monitor. <laughs> oh, no, I need to stop sharing and go to that. That's what I need to do. Uh, so I'm going to stop share the presentation. And then share. There we go. Okay, now I think you should be seeing it. Okay, so yeah, here's our, our website hosted on CSU's Center for Collaborative Conservation website, but they've been gracious enough to allow us to have our uh, a separate page there. Um, and here's some of the linked information that I mentioned. Um, I'll just click on this, so they open pretty quick. So, there's just some information some uh, about the Preble's mouse. Here's kind of a, a map that shows its range, like I mentioned. So Casper is right about here where my cursor is, high 25 coming down. And so it's right along the foothills going down to Crawler Springs. You can see this is the Denver metropolitan area. With all the metropolitan development, Preble's, they would have been there a long time ago before Denver grew up, but they don't seem to occur in urban metropolitan areas. Um, I want to close that, but the Zoom, hold on a second. Okay. Um, and then, oh, let that go to that. I must have I must have clicked. Oh, there, oh no, there it is. So here's the other information. So there's a, there, here's another information sheet. That's the frequently asked questions document that I mentioned. And then here's a link to our our draft nomination map. There is a link to the full roster with contact information that that Heather mentioned earlier. Um, there's a link to the Fish and Wildlife Service website with Preble's information. But this is what I wanted to share, and this is the last thing I'll show. Um, and before I turn it over to actually, I think another poll and then George San Miguel will take it away. So this is just a really cool video of actual Preble's mouse. So you'll probably never get a chance to, you know, see more in life. You make that don't blink once this opens up because they are very fast. It shows in slow mo here. So. You can really get a good look at the long, the big hind legs in this video too. And they're pretty incredible jumping athleticism. <laughs> um, one thing I don't think Rob mentioned uh, that this might be something that somebody would have said, oh, that's something cool I learned about Preble's mice is I believe they're they're actually pretty good, pretty darn good swimmers too. Um, Rob mentioned that in one of our earlier meetings. So that is um, that is all I had. Great, thank you, Dale. I will uh, put our second poll up here. Let's see. And um, this is just a question for you all. Of what uh, is the best way for us to communicate with you in the future? Um, so if you can take a second to choose one. And this will just help us be efficient in uh, how we get information out to you all.
All right, and Rob says they are great swimmers indeed. So <laughs> hopefully we can get some video of that someday. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds here, but it looks like um, pretty much everyone prefers email. So that's great to know. Um, and I did put the link in to uh, the chat there if you would like to join our email list. All right, so that is a 100% email. Great, thank you all so much. That's really helpful. And we'll pass it off to George. Good evening, everyone. I'm George San Miguel with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm going to be speaking to you today about the uh, recovery process that we and the site conservation team are using uh, to discuss um, the recovery process and also to explain the draft nomination map and how it will be used and then explain what recovery would mean for land owners and land managers. So one of the things that we want to understand is that the uh, what is the, the status of the mouse, and that is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Listed threatened means a species is at risk of becoming endangered. So it's a, a lower level of risk at this time. Being listed as endangered means a species is at risk of extinction. So we certainly don't want a threatened species to be uh, changed in its status to endangered. Now, the recovery process for a threatened species does not mean restoring a species to its natural condition. That would require such an enormous change to the, uh, our society that we wouldn't be able to, to accomplish that. So that's not our goal in recovery. However, to recover means to return to a normal state of health and strength. And to restore is to return something to a former condition, place, or position. So I just want to make sure that people understand that we're not trying to bring the species back to everywhere that it was. It has been eliminated from most of its range, but it, there are still enough of them around that we have not uh, considered them at risk of extinction yet. So the recovery process as provided by the Endangered Species Act is a different, has a different um, definition. A recovered species no longer needs any Endangered Species Act protection. That's because it's been judged that there are enough protected populations to secure the species from becoming endangered, thus allowing for delisting. So the threshold for delisting for recovery is a lot lower than restoration or uh, being completely restored to what it was before. The recovery plan for the Preble's mouse divided the species' range into watersheds called hydrologic units, or HUCs for short. Mice only occupy small pockets in each of these watersheds. The red line on the map uh, divides the hucks into north and south units. The red stars are the large recovery population watersheds, the North Poudre River huck being the northern one. The blue stars are the medium population watersheds, and the others without stars are the small population watersheds. So the criteria for delisting uh, the Preble's mouse is uh, <clears throat> the mouse will be considered recovered and eligible for delisting when these seven items are achieved. I'm only going to concentrate on the first three at this time. Remember that you'll get a copy of this later so you can study the greater detail. So delisting when there are two large populations designated, there are five medium populations designated, and all other occupied watersheds have at least one small population designated in each of them. Three is preferred. 
but we are finding that it's probably not possible to get three in all of the smalls. And the criteria for recovering a population for the Preble's mouse is in the large populations, which is what the, the North uh, Hooter River is a large, at least 2,500 Preble's mice occupying at least 57 miles of connected Preble's mouse habitat. And that is a, a tall order, but uh, and our job is to find out if we can find enough room for the large population in the Pooter. So the site conservation team has used a variety of resources to determine whether uh, in the North Pooter River watershed, we should nominate the recovery population, where it should be. Among these resources are capture surveys. The green dots on this map show where Preble's mice have been captured so far. Red dots show unsuccessful capture attempts, but unsuccessful capture attempts would not indicate that they are absent from there because Preble's mice are notoriously difficult to catch. Other information the site conservation team has considered are land ownership data obtained from publicly available sources. There is an abundance of public land in the watershed, as well as private lands with trusts and conservation easements. The habitat um, had to be evaluated because there's still a lot of missing information the site conservation team needed. Despite having a few, uh, a few capture surveys, the North Poudre River watershed has yet to have conducted in it any population level studies. So the SCT has had to rely on its own habitat assessments to determine the extent of where the Preble's mice are likely to be. So we went out to several locations on public lands and on private lands where we were granted access permission and sampled the habitat conditions to generate habitat ratings scores. Let's take a look at a study site near uh, at night, site number 32 in the pink circle at the lower left of the map along the North Pine Creek. North Lone Pine Creek, excuse me. SCT members visited dozens of sites. The data and photos allowed us to document and rate current conditions at these reference points, which could then be used to compare and interpret most conditions up and down the watershed alongside aerial photography. So we generated a lot of data and we uh, saved it all in the uh, spreadsheets. The SCT made extensive use of Google Maps and Google Earth imagery to assign habitat rating scores between the sample points. In studying the photography, we noted changes in the habitat conditions and physical barriers. All of this material was compiled to generate a summary map of habitat ratings. The habitat ratings map will be improved over the years as we gather more facts, but it is based on the uh, best information we have currently. The map depicts two different habitat ratings simultaneously, both of which are designed to help us estimate the population numbers for Preble's mice along each stream reach. The most obvious feature on this map is the color scheme. Orange represents high estimated population densities, yellow is medium, and white is low. Then also note how the stream map lines vary in thickness. In general, the thicker line, the thicker the line, the larger the area of habitat that is present along that stream reach. Compare the very narrow habitat along Stonewall Creek in the northeastern part of the map to the wide habitat along the North Poudre River 
between Halligan Dam and Seaman Reservoir. Other habitats are shown as intermediate in width. From these two factors and the length of each reach, we added the results of population density calculations from Preble, Preble's mouse studies in other watersheds. Preble's mouse populations are most often expressed as mice per length of stream, not area. Fewer mice live in habitats that are naturally narrow, are degraded, or face other threats and stressors. Studies in these other watersheds show population densities can vary from as little as six mice per mile in poor habitats to as many as 154 mice per mile in optimal habitats. The approximate average for all studies is about 44 mice per mile, but this is highly variable from year to year. There are approximately 102 miles uh, uh, in the proposed recovery population area, well above the minimum 57 miles. Preble's mouse population estimates here vary from six, miles, six mice per mile to 100 mice per mile. The SCT estimates there are reliably close to 4,000 mice within the re proposed recovery population area but the number will vary from year to year. The conservation planning map is not uh, final yet. It, 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 it will be used to help justify the recovery population nomination. Designation of a recovery population will not require land management changes. All associated partnerships and agreements to promote Preble's mouse populations and habitat would be voluntary. There could be financial opportunities for landowners who choose to apply for habitat conservation assistance. And ultimately the Preble's mouse would be removed from the list of threatened species once all the recovery criteria are met. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. I'll be available for questions later, I suppose. Thank you, George. Great, thank you all. That was excellent. Uh, a lot of great information shared from all of our speakers. Um, and you've probably been hearing my voice, but um, I'm Megan and with CPRW. And uh, before we go into q and I'm going to have Heather just close us out here. So go for it, Heather. Thanks, Megan. Um, thanks, Rob, um, Dale, and George for sharing all of that information. Um, and I'm hoping that while I just sum up here a little bit that you start putting questions in the Q&A for the discussion section. So a few things I just wanted to highlight, you know, this is the beginning of our collective understanding about the Preble's mouse and this new approach to engaging the community in recovering and delisting the species. I think we're all here because we care about this place and the presence of so much habitat in our watershed really tells us that we have good stewards. Um, we have people doing land management practices that are compatible with prebles and of course many other species as well. Um, that means that our rivers and streams are healthy. They also provide um, benefits to us in the community as well. The ability to produce local food, the ability to enjoy the natural resources as well. And also this opportunity to continue that good stewardship for all of those um, species, including this mouse. Um, a reminder that we are in a good position in the North Fork of the Poudre. We've already estimated that about 60% um, of the stream miles occur on public lands and already privately conserved um, lands as well. So that sets us in a good position to reach our goals. 
Um, there are some places you saw on the map where there may be opportunities for improvement. And if landowners and land managers are interested and willing, uh, the SCT is happy to talk further and see if we can um, develop partnerships and resources to support landowners that want to voluntarily make changes. Um, you know, we, we've used the best information that we have currently available to us. Um, we have, we're all largely volunteering our time, and so we have limited capacity, but we'd love to go out on more places in the watershed, verify this information, gather more knowledge, and improve our maps and our plan going forward. So if any, any landowners are interested in hosting us, we would love to talk further about that. Megan I'm, and Alice, I'm going to hand this off to you now. Um, to go into our discussion and question and answer. Great. Thank you, Heather. Okay, so it looks like we have a few questions here. Um, this first one I wanted to address, uh, someone asked in the, uh, in the chat earlier. Let me pull it up here. If a landowner finds pebbles on their property, what happens next? might be a good question for George or Dale. Well, there's no, there's no um, difficulty for the landowner as far as having a mouse on the property because um, information that they are present is no different from theoretically it being there because it is still listed as a threatened species. So any, um, regulatory or consultation requirements would be the same whether it's confirmed that the mouse is present or that it is theoretically there based on um, the condition of the habitat and, and its geography. So in, in all practical sense, there's no difference. Um, if you see the mouse, uh, you're lucky. Most people will never see them because they're mostly nocturnal. Great, thank you, George. And we had a question in the uh, Q&A here. Um, and it looks like uh, this is from John. He asked, would the proposed Glade Reservoir damage mouse habitat? And Alice, do you wanna speak a little bit more to the answer that you put in the chat for him? Yes, and, and John's question was specific to Glade Reservoir, which I'm not directly uh, involved with others uh, might be able to speak more to it, but I did put a link to the conceptual mitigation plan included uh, with the, the environmental impact statement for that project. And that is where uh, so at least summary level information and maybe some more detail about the impacts and mitigation plans. So that's a good starting point. And I wanna open it up if there's others um, who have more detail to provide an answer there. Could you repeat the question? Yes, the question was, would the proposed Glade Reservoir, that's a Northern Water project, would that damage mouse habitat? Hmm. Uh, we have another biologist on our staff that has been handling the Glade Reservoir, so I plead ignorance, I apologize, but mm -hmm. we have to divide up the, uh, the job responsibilities and that one is not one of mine, so I'm sorry. Megan, I'll, I'll try and provide some feedback on how reservoirs can be challenging for the mouse. Please. Be, because uh, this mouse is so reliant on that dense vegetation that's associated with wetland areas, as the water levels of reservoirs change over time, it can compromise the, the moisture that provides that dense habitat. So reservoirs by nature don't always provide the breadth of riparian systems that we see along some of these creeks. So they can be really challenging, even as connecting habitat sometimes for this mouse. Great, thank you, Rob. Then we have a question from Andrew Seidel. If there's anyone can comment on contribution or concern of housing encroachment near the watershed and uh, nuances from, uh, Sorry, nuisances from human activity, house cats, et cetera. Maybe that's a good Rob question. 
there's no doubt that the proximity of human activity is detrimental to the habitat for jumping mice. Typically, as we build closer and closer, is those systems for that habitat don't have the breadth to expand, and the wetlands that provide the moisture for those systems don't have the capacity to expand. So it's difficult to maintain some of these broad, um, dense habitats in that kind of close proximity to, to development, but it's also, as you've mentioned, a better access for some external predator, predators that jumping mice aren't normally exposed to, like house cats. And they found that house cats were feeding on jumping mice, this study in Douglas County back in the late 1990s. I would add to that that uh, especially higher density developments uh, result in a lot of stormwater runoff, which then erodes the stream and dries out the riparian vegetation. And that would also damage the habitat by uh, shrinking it, drying it out. Uh, and that's a, a serious problem in a lot of the uh, urbanized parts of the Front Range. Uh, great example of that would be the area around uh, the town of Monument and Colorado Springs and a few other places too. And also, I would just um, I would just add to the um, the discussion here that um, fortunately in the North Fork of the Poudre water, watershed we don't have that intense development that's extensive down our streams and and um, creeks. So um, you know as as George just gave the example further down the Front Range, that encroachment has occurred at high levels. Uh, in close proximity, whereas in our watershed, we don't have um, that situation. Yeah, there's no, there are no mice known to exist in the Poudre River from Fort Collins on down. Great, thank you all. And David had a question um, that says habitat being critical and grazing being a primary use of these lands. Uh, do you see any restrictions on grazing leases to address habitat recovery? Might be a good question for you, George. I think that's a Dale question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dale. Uh, sure, I can take that. Um, so grazing management is not just on its face incompatible with mouse habitat. It's, it's the relative impacts from the grazing, the intensity of grazing. So um, you like uh, the North Fork Pooter on the, on, on the Cane Lakes Ranger District has, is in a grazing allotment and there's been Preble's mice captured there. Um, so that's an area though, uh, that is you know, one of the prevalent wide, in terms of area of widespread management actions, obviously, in the watershed. And um, that is an area where habitat improvement actions can make a difference. It, you know, can improve the habitat uh, for mice um, if, you know, if it's, if the grazing is a little heavier. It, it's just, um, you know, it's just variable. But as George mentioned in his presentation, um, none of this brings mandatory um, constraints or requirements. It, it's all voluntary. Um, whether a landowner chooses to uh, take on a habitat management or improvement project on their on their land to improve mice, um, it's it's voluntary. Um, and and as as Heather mentioned at the outset, and and as you might have noticed on our map. The majority of the stream lengths we rate uh, through uh, all of them we rated as high or or moderate habitat suitability. There are some stretches of low. Um, sometimes that probably has is grazing as part of the reason. Sometimes it's because there's a ranch or a or a home site right on the river, and there's things that we just talked about in the question from Andrew that we are making assumptions about anyways. Um, so I think. I'll leave it at that. Megan, and I would just add regarding grazing that 
Um, for example, on Rixton, my property, we graze it, uh, our neighbor leases it, and we've had Preble's Meadow jumping mouse trapped on our property. So, um, you know, grazing is, is a tool that can be used well or can be overused, just like any tool. And we have a lot of good examples in our watershed of good grazing management. And we have some places where we can maybe improve a little. Um, but grazing is currently seen in our watershed as um, uh, activity that's important and a land use that's important. And we want to see it continue and good grazing management to continue as well. So I think um, we've got lots of examples of different kinds of grazing management in our watershed and many of those with um, good or moderate um, habitat and a few places where um, if landowners are interested, they could make some changes and improvements if they if they voluntarily wish to do that. Great. Thank you, Heather. And a, a related question that Della has to agriculture is what about effects of agricultural runoff on the North Fork? Um, does anyone, can anyone speak to that as how it would affect Preble's? I, I could speak just generally to that. Um, we don't have a lot of examples of um, intensive agricultural use that would cause um, runoff and affect water quality in the North Fork of the Pooter. Um, that might occur in places if you had, for example, um, some activity that uh, removed um, all of the surface uh, vegetation and then um, chemical runoff occurred or a very large feedlot, for example, very close down to a riparian area without any kind of um, uh, sections of, of uh, vegetation or other surfaces that would absorb runoff. We don't have examples of that in our watershed. Um, we've not seen water quality data that shows that as being a large concern in the North Fork. But maybe somebody else has an example from somewhere else um, that might answer the question. Okay, thank you, Heather. I guess yeah. I'd only like say uh, oh, just yeah. real quick, you know, like Heather mentioned, the water quality in the North Fork Pooter and the tributaries is there's no knowledge of any kind of, you know, <laughs> like toxicity levels. And although the mouse swims in the water, you know, I think the water is good enough that it's it's basically a terrestrial animal, so it doesn't you know it's not like a fish. So uh, given that the water quality is generally good anyways, I, I just don't think there's impacts occurring now, from in that way. Also, just to, there's a guy there's a couple of questions in the chat, Megan. Yep, I was actually looking at those because they are um, some questions for I'm going to direct for to Rob. Uh, what is the understanding of connectivity between habitats? In other words, how mobile can individuals be in order to provide connectivity? Great question. Um, even though Dale said these aren't fish, as I typically try to describe their movement patterns as these being furry fish, because <laughs> their, their main movements are upstream and downstream, is they don't move away from the system that often and so their way of dispersing and connecting with other populations is linearly as the creek flows so to try and answer that more directly when i've had telemeters on them um, over maybe um, the, the batteries of these small telemeters don't last very long is they'll stay pretty tight into a habitat area but over long term marking and recapturing individuals i've had some that have traveled um, upwards of three miles over the course of a couple of years up and down through that system. And so our, our tight window of just observing them for the life of a telemeter doesn't really describe their full lifetime movement pattern. So these systems can really be connected as long as that habitat exists there. And the, the limitations on how mice will move through unvegetated systems is really challenging for us to understand. We don't think they do that very well, in part because we think they need cover from predators. And 
probably need access to some of the resources they would need in, in transitioning between these sites. Great, thank you, Robin. You kind of touched on this next question from Andy related to Michael's question about how far a single mice can migrate in a season and over its lifetime. So I think you kind of touched on the lifetime. Um, not, not sure if there's difference in the season versus lifetime, but thank you for answering those. Um, and then Reed has a question um, in the Q&A, uh, can new home construction be limited or restricted by the mouse's presence? To, to some degree, that is correct. Uh, we see large numbers of uh, proposals for housing developments all up and down the front range. And generally speaking, they can proceed as long as they um, can, sh can indicate that their development would have no, um, either have no effect, no proven effect on the Preble's mouse habitat, or if their development would have an impact, that they're willing to mitigate that impact. In other words, if they were to damage, say, um, five acres of Preble's mouse habitat in a large subdivision, then they would have to dedicate 10 acres of land for its preservation. So there's a way of compensating for uh, habitat that's going to be definitely damaged, but in no way is it going to be completely forbidden. But there's always a way to try to accommodate development, uh, but uh, every little development or every big development, every, everything has a cumulative effect. And it's difficult for the Fish and Wildlife Service to quantify every, every bit of that. So we ask developers to show that they've done all that they can to avoid the impact, to minimize it. And if they can't do all of that in every circumstance, then to mitigate it in the benefit, for the benefit of the mouse as much as possible. Great, great questions, everyone. Um, oh, it looks like we have one more question here. Um, there have been major fire events up and down the watershed due, uh, due to fuel loads that used to be mitigated by buffalo, et cetera. Doesn't cattle grazing mitigate the buildup of fuel that has been so recently demonstrated in the past 50 years as no creature great or small benefits from wildfires? I don't know if it's a question as much of a comment. Anyone? want to speak to the, to that. And ho, uh, panelists, you can see that in your chat. Um, I'll, I'll comment on that a bit. Um, you know, the fires that we've had like Cameron Peak and High Park, they've been up in the mountains. Um, and I don't believe that was historic bison range or buffalo range. Um, you know, grass fires, um, Sometimes there's grass fires out on the Pliny National Grassland, usually started by shooting, but uh, you know, it burns through and then the really actually usually the next the very next the very same season, because the fires are usually, you know, during the dormant season, let fall through winter, it it greens up and grows back and you'd almost never know there was a fire there. Um, more generally about fire impacts on Preble's mouse, what I have seen um, where, where the Cameron Peak fire or the High Park fire or the Hewlett Gulch fire has burned um, in down to creeks that were Preble's habitat is that more often than not, the fire doesn't impact, doesn't burn the actual riparian vegetation very much or at all because they're, jet, they're green, you know, there's water there and it's generally greener. And a lot of times there's low fuel loads too because it's open ponderosa pine or just meadow or shrubland. And so the fire will just kind of peter out when it hits the green vegetation. Sometimes it is higher severity. Um, often that's because there's, uh, there have, it happens in instances where there's conifer cover right over the stream and the fire is really burning the, the pine trees that generates so much heat it burns everything up. But that's really the exception. And then the other thing about riparian zone is because the water 
presence, they're very, very um, productive. And, and also the riparian shrubs, willows, alders, birch, they, they grow, they, they grow back very rapidly. The root, the root masses aren't killed by the fires. So even if they're burned off at the top, which usually doesn't happen unless there's a lot of dead stems that can't catch fire, they will grow back, start growing back immediately and they can, you know, they grow very rapidly, you know, two, they can grow two or three feet in height in a single season. And of course the herbaceous vegetation grows back also immediately once the first growing season comes around. And with regard to uh, bison grazing and how cattle might affect that or mimic it, it there is a, a little bit of a, uh, comparison there. However, bison in their natural state would be in a riparian area for a short period of time and then move on. Um, some cattle grazing does concentrate the animals for long periods of time where the impact would be different. So the, the bottom line is that cattle grazing in riparian areas, if it's done briefly, can be beneficial and, and, and mimic what bison would have done naturally. And I'll add a last piece of that about fire and its impact on some systems is that there are some species that have adapted to fire and need it to thrive. There are pine trees that are, they call serotonous that require fire as a seeding mechanism. And fire has historically maintained some of these ecosystems to allow species to thrive. So it's, it's not always um, demonizing the fire, but the scale at which fire takes hold now because of historic management practices escalates those impacts. Great. Well, this has been a great discussion. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time here and we would love to um, spin our, our wheel of names here to choose some winners. Um, it looks like, however, really quickly, Della has a uh, hand raised. So Della, if you want to put your uh, comment in the chat. We would love to hear your comment. Um, but I'm gonna uh, share my screen here really quick. And I'm just gonna uh, spin some names here to win a CPRW hat. So thank you all for sticking around. And looks like Murray is what I saw in, in the participant name in the chat there. So Murray, um, you have won a CPRW hat. So I will uh, go ahead and send you an email and uh, we will get you uh, the hat mailed to you. Next, I've got a couple um, really nice uh, silicone CPRW cups. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm holding them up. These are great for camping or hanging out on the river. So I'm going to spin again here. <laughs> and Suzanne with a Z. Suzanne with a Z. All right. So two cups coming your way, Suzanne. And then last but not least, we've got two uh, coffee travel mugs from City of Fort Collins Utilities. So we got a pair of those for Debbie. All right. All right, so that was a little bit of fun for you all. <laughs> um, oh, and Della, very quickly, is there any citizen science opportunity or ways people can enhance habitat? Um, so as far as citizen science opportunities within this group, um, is there, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, I know that CPRW, Coalition for the Purdue River Watershed, we have a citizen science water quality monitoring program, but that's uh, not related to the work we're doing here at SCT. Does anyone else have any knowledge of citizen science opportunities? There may be, oh, I'm oh. sorry. I was, just say, I was just gonna say real quick, as Dale mentioned, jumping mice aren't easy to observe. It'd be great if we could have people tell us where they see jumping mice, to, but they're just so, I can count on my hand how many times I've seen them without having them in a trap. So they're just really difficult to detect unless you're trapping. 
in the future, not right away, but in the in future years, there will be probably some restoration projects that the site conservation team will be helping to sponsor. And so there might be some opportunities to help at that time. Great. All right. Um, Heather, did you want to just uh, close us out here as we uh, reach 630? Yeah, I'd be glad to do it. Let me just uh, share my screen. Well, thank you everybody for your great questions and comments and thoughts. Um, thank you very much to um, Rob and Dale and George for speaking this evening. I think, um, I know I always learn something more every time I hear uh all three of you speak also um very much appreciate megan and alice you helping with um the whole presentation uh the swag for the opportunity drawing as well from both the coalition for the puder river watershed and the city of fort collins utility thank you for that that's quite fun rob sorry you didn't get to win there um, also want to thank um, the center for collaborative conservation at csu for hosting our web page and we hope that you will continue to track this project um, through our webpage. You can see the link right there. Um, also, um, we, we hear that you'd like to be contacted via email. <clears throat> Please um, put in the chat your email address or, or send it to me or to Dale. Um, you can also go to our website and there's a form you can fill out there. So we'd prefer it if we could um, contact you more efficiently with updates on the project and event notices. Um, Megan mentioned earlier there'll be an email coming out to all the attendees tomorrow and it'll have um, a link to the recording. Um, please share it with your neighbors um, and also um, we'll have the resources in there as well for uh, as a reminder for everybody. Um, we're planning um, a spring watershed tour. We're hoping to go out onto both public and private land and look at examples of um, land uses um, and habitat and hope that you'll um, be interested in that and perhaps join us. And then lastly, we would love to have more landowners on the site conservation team. So if you're interested, please contact either myself or Dale Oblug and um, we can talk more about what that entails. You'd be welcome to attend a meeting to listen. We meet every other month. And, um, and then we hope that a few more landowners would join us. So thank you again, everybody. Um, we really have um, appreciated your time this evening. Uh, we appreciate your care for the watershed and your good stewardship. And we look forward to hearing more from all of you and hope to see you on our spring watershed tour. Stay well. <laughs>